Hello everybody, welcome to another edition of Five Facts. Today we're talking about the 1982 classic Blade Runner. It's from director Ridley Scott, it's a sci-fi noir movie, and it is absolutely essential that you see this movie. Get the final cut, came out in 2007 on Blu-ray, and it is totally worth your time. I decided to jump out of horror this week because the sequel for Blade Runner is coming out. It's been 35 years since we've seen this original movie, and they're finally getting a sequel with Ryan Gosling and Harrison Ford and everybody else. So, I'm excited to check that out this weekend, and I wanted to give you guys a few more facts about the original. Fact number one, the glowing eyes were actually done with a practical effect using mirrors. One of the first things I wondered about when I saw this movie was how they did the eye effect, where it would just kind of glow for the replicants and some of the other people in the movie. Ridley Scott and Jordan Cronenworth achieved the famous shining eyes effect by using a technique known as the Schriften process. I might have butchered that, it is German. Light is bounced into the actor's eyes off a piece of half-mirrored glass mounted at a 45 degree angle to the camera. The process has been used in film all the way back to 1927, with Metropolis and a bunch of other movies from that era. A lot of times it was used to put people in front of miniatures before they had blue screens. It was a really cool thing that's been around for a long time. Director of Photography Jordan Cronenworth notes, To achieve this effect, we use a two-way mirror, 50% transmission, 50% reflection, placed in front of a lens at a 45-degree angle. Then we'd project a light onto the mirror so that it would be reflected in the eyes of the subject along the optical axis of the lens. We'd sometimes use very subtle gels to add color to the eyes. Often, we'd photograph a scene with and without this effect so Ridley would have the option of when he'd use it. So I, I'm guessing there's a lot of times where they decided that it was just distracting from a scene or it didn't add anything, or if it didn't look right, they could have just taken it entirely out of the movie. Fact number two, the futurescape for LA was mostly models. Using forced perspective, the crew was able to turn a 13 foot by 18 foot deep wide model into a city. They used numerous objects from other films to make futuristic buildings, most notably starships. One of these you can actually see the Millennium Falcon turn onto its side. The model looked very cheap under normal lighting, so Scott used rain, fog, and darkness to hide the materials. The most impressive singular model was for the Tyrell Pyramid. It was a 9-foot square at the base and 2.5 and feet high. It's a ratio of 1 to 750. It was made out of plexiglass and then painted black. The paint was scratched out where there were supposed to be windows. A powerful light was placed inside to show these windows being lit because the light was actually very hot and filming the model took a lot of time. It actually caught on fire and melted. Fortunately, this happened near the end of the shoot when the necessary shots had been completed. Fact number three. Deckard's pistol is a combination of several guns. The 2019 LAPD blaster that Deckard uses is actually assembled from several different guns. It took the receiver from a Steyr model SL-222 long rifle. The handle was a style taken from the Charter Arms Bulldog 44 Special. The prop makers cut the barrel and took the stock off the gun and added a pistol grip along with some LEDs. The gun ended up being extremely heavy, twice as much as a normal pistol. It was chambered for 5.56mm ammunition, which required the special use of blanks when it was fired on the set, both for being so much louder and more powerful. Fact number four. One of the more subtle changes happened in a reshoot for the final cut of Blade Runner. The scene where Zora, played by Jonah Cassidy, crashes through the sheets of glass was shot near the end of production. The budget and time were running out, so the scene had to be done very hastily. This caused some obvious continuity problems, since it clearly wasn't Cassidy doing the scene. It was actually a stunt woman, Lee Poyford, wearing a bad wig that somebody just happened to bring to the set. For the final cut of the film, one day of entirely new shooting took place, which has become known as the green screen shoot. New footage of Cassidy was shot, and face replacement technology was used to digitally replace Pulford's face with Cassidy's. Not only was Cassidy thrilled that Zora's costume still fit her, but the crew working on the shot were amazed at how easily Cassidy was able to exactly mimic her actions from 25 years before. Fact number five. The idea for Philip K. Dick's novel that would lead to Blade Runner came from Nazi barbarism. Philip K. Dick first came up with the idea for his novel Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep in 1962 when researching The Man in the High Castle which deals with the Nazis conquering the planet in the 1940s. It's also a Hulu series now. Dick had been granted access to archive World War II Gestapo documents in the UC Berkeley Library and had come across diaries written by SS men stationed in Poland, which he found almost unreadable in their casual cruelty and lack of human empathy. One sentence in particular troubled him. 
we are kept awake at the night by cries of starving children. Dick was so horrified by this sentence that he reasoned that there was obviously something wrong with the man who wrote it. This led him to hypothesize that Nazism in general was a defective group mind, a mind so emotionally flawed that the word human could not be applied to them. Their lack of empathy was so pronounced that Dick reasoned that they couldn't be referred to as human beings, even though their outward appearance seemed to indicate that they were human. The novel sprang from this, and interestingly enough, it is now thought by some people that they are occupational psychopaths due to low-functioning amygdala, the fear centers in the brain's limbic system. For me, this could have two different meanings. The way the Blade Runners would actually go down and hunt the replicants just so callously. Like, you see Harrison Ford as a very callous person with a lack of humanity. But it also could be for the replicants being not quite human, especially with how brutal they are whenever they're going to try and find their way to immortality, or at least to not die in four years after their creation. I kind of like the idea that it's a little bit of both. So much of this movie is perfect to me. The mood, many of the effects, the acting. There's just something special about Blade Runner. I even like the ambiguity of the ending. I'm of course referring to the idea that Deckard himself is a replicant. This can go back and forth over and over again. Harrison Ford claims that he and Ridley Scott decided that Deckard was not a replicant while they were filming, but Ridley Scott later would edit it to add this sort of ambiguity in there. Rugger Hauer would agree, as he believed that the main conflict was Deckard finding his inner humanity. He also thought that making Deckard a replicant took away from the ending, where it was supposed to be man versus machine instead of machine versus machine. I think that this could go a little bit different, like that Deckard is the newer model, he, especially since in the sequel he's still alive. Probably. That could be something that gets revealed that he could be another model, like, rebuilt or something like that. We'll see what happens in the sequel. But he could be a newer model that doesn't have the limitations of the other one, just like Rachel might have survived beyond what happens in this movie. We didn't know if she actually had that four-year lifespan or not. That was never clarified. I can see both perspectives, but if Deckard is indeed a replicant, finding his humanity while still being a machine raises a lot of interesting philosophical questions. If you want to see an argument in full for this, watch Ex Machina. Albert and I have had a lot of talks about this on various podcasts and things about whether or not these machines could actually be considered human if, in all actuality, they can't even tell the difference. There's a lot to unpack here, and I'd love to hear what you guys have to say in the comments. Do you believe that Deckard was a replicant? What did you think of this movie? Did you see the final cut? Did you see the theatrical cut? There's so many different cuts of this movie that it, it gets a little bit weird. Just let me know what you thought in the comments. Also, tell me if you're going to go check out the sequel, if you're excited for it. And yeah, just let us know what you guys think. Also, put some movie suggestions in there, especially related to horror, as I'm going to be doing this series for a while. If you enjoy this series, go ahead and hit that like button and subscribe. Or if you really enjoy it, check out our Patreon. For as little as $2 a month, you can make this show thrive. $2 doesn't seem like a lot, but it's worth thousands on thousands of YouTube views. And it's also a great way to support the artists that you care about. There are a lot of benefits to membership, such as postcards, pins, all sorts of really cool stuff. At higher levels, you get shirts. There's a lot that we like to do for our fans and our patrons. So go ahead and check that out in the link at the end of this video. We'll see you guys next week as we're going to be doing five different movies for October. We're going to be doing Eraserhead next week. So I'm excited to keep this whole train moving and put out a bunch of really cool stuff for you guys for October. Have a good day.